Hello everyone, Ace here, and today, well, I'm just going to have to go ahead and say it. Grums is wrong about censorship. Calling for legal bans on wokeness in order to achieve a victory in the culture war is a bad idea. It's a bad idea for a number of reasons. And as much as I think Grums has good takes most of the time, the simple truth is that anyone can make a mistake. And to be fair, I do get the sentiment. We've had to put up with far leftists for over a decade at this point, using every dirty tactic they can, and then some. We've seen how thoroughly the scales are skewed in their favor. We've seen the various forms of rampant censorship that they openly encourage. So I fully understand where Grums is coming from, as well as those who are supporting him. And I'm not exactly adverse to the idea of doing unto others as they do to you. That still does not, however, make Grums' call for censorship here a good idea. There are numerous reasons why it is in fact a very bad idea, which I will very quickly go over. For a start, this premise is built upon the idea of giving the establishment more power. The establishment that already favors the far left. Admittedly, this favorship is starting to diminish, especially when far leftists decided to keep holding political rallies to celebrate the terrorist attacks committed by Hamas, and suggesting that Hamas was merely trying to, quote, decolonize, unquote. Even still, it should be very obvious that the establishment is not your friend, and should not be trusted in the slightest. So the natural reaction towards any efforts to give the establishment more power, especially in the name of screwing over your political opponent, should be treated with the utmost suspicion, and in almost all cases rejected outright entirely. We especially do not need legal precedent for additional tools of censorship that could very easily be used against people who reject wokeness. And as unfair and flat out illegal as the censorship against those who reject wokeness has been so far, it could very easily become much much, much worse. You need only look at countries that don't actually respect free speech, like the UK or Germany, to see just how bad censorship can be when there's actual legal precedent backing it, at least provided we are limiting our search to Western societies. Though on that subject, it is also the perfect opportunity to bring up a second reason why Grums's idea about censorship is a terrible one. That being that it is demonstrably ineffective at achieving the results the far left have been trying to achieve for the past decade. It's blatant to see that wokeness has been given every advantage imaginable, and yet despite all of this, it is failing spectacularly, to the tune that companies like Disney cannot financially sustain wokeness. It is simply too unpopular with the general public. The normies have, by and large, rejected wokeness. By contrast, those that have been railing against wokeness have not exactly died out now, have they? Despite every effort taken to censor them. My own channel, for example, has faced numerous cancellation attempts. I was even demonetized for about 18 months at one point. Yet still, these efforts proved ultimately futile. I was still getting the occasional video to go viral every now and then, and still gained almost an additional half my subscriber count during that time frame. You know, despite the scales being so thoroughly skewed against me. So like I said, the far-left efforts of censorship did not work in the end. So with that context in mind, it becomes utterly nonsensical to use such failed tactics of your political opponent, as unpleasant as it may be to experience those kinds of tactics firsthand. But then I need to move on to the third reason why this is a bad idea. And to do that, allow me to quickly go over the purpose behind the kind of censorship that far leftists have been pushing. And simply put, that purpose was simply to give far leftism a fighting chance, ideologically speaking, because in a fair marketplace of ideas, far leftism would never have been popular. The ideological principles behind wokeism is so fundamentally disgusting that it would actively drive people away. The only way far leftists could ever hope to win was by silencing everyone else as much as possible to the tune that only far leftist ideas could ever be expressed. Even then, though, it turned out that wokeism is so disgusting that you don't actually need alternative viewpoints to destroy it. The best tool to destroy wokeness is to simply highlight its own word-for-word -word rhetoric. Those of you that are longtime viewers will no doubt know about how I like to do the occasional community post, simply highlighting things far leftists have said to me. 
me. Usually the far leftist in question ends up advocating for rape, because ultimately that's something that wokeism fundamentally supports when you get down to it. And when you can conclusively prove beyond any doubt that Marxism is an ideology of rape, or that democratic socialism is an ideology of rape, or that progressivism is an ideology of rape, or any other alias that wokeists will hide behind to pretend to be somehow different this time, well, that completely destroys any good faith the public may have had towards them. And if you think I'm being hyperbolic in my description of the far left, well, allow me to reuse this clip of me reading what far leftist academic sources have said in the past to make it very clear that no, this is not a few bad apples within the ideology, it is the ideology in its entirety that is the problem. To start off, allow me to read to you what the far-left socialist Wilhelm Reich had to say in his book titled The Mass Psychology of Fascism. Specifically, Reich states, quote, We have found the institutions in which the economic and the sexual interests of the authoritarian system meet. We have to ask ourselves how this comes about. This question is also answered by character analysis, provided one does not exclude such questions from character analytic investigation. Suppression of the natural sexuality in the child, particularly of its genital sexuality, makes the child apprehensive, shy, obedient, afraid of authority, good, and adjusted in the authoritarian sense. It paralyzes the rebellious forces because any rebellion is laden with anxiety. It produces, by inhibiting sexual curiosity and sexual thinking in the child, a general inhibition of thinking and of critical faculties. In brief, the goal of sexual suppression is that of producing an individual who is adjusted to the authoritarian order, and who will submit to it in spite of all misery and degradation. At first, the child has to adjust to the structure of the authoritarian miniature state. The family this makes it capable of later subordination to the general authoritarian system. The formation of the authoritarian structure takes place through the anchoring of sexual inhibition and sexual anxiety. The result of this process is fear of freedom and a conservative reactionary mentality. Sexual repression aids political reaction not only through this process, which makes the mass individual passive and unpolitical, but also by creating in his structure an interest in actively supporting the authoritarian order. The suppression of natural sexual gratification leads to various kinds of substitute gratifications. Natural aggression, for example, becomes brutal sadism, which then is an essential mass psychological factor in imperialistic wars. In other words, Wilhelm Reich is arguing that sexual repression turns people into fascists. And it is worth noting that he is, of course, basing his ideas upon the far-left myth that fascists were somehow far-right. And for the record, they weren't. However, the key takeaway to keep in mind here is that this far leftist academic has taken up the position that sexual repression of children directly leads to fascism. And so if you're someone that believes Wilhelm Reich's position, then the best way to stop fascism by that logic would be to, of course, sexualize children. Now, any sane, rational individual knows that this is an absolutely horrific idea and would be truly appalled by it. Unfortunately, the people who take up this position are neither sane nor rational. But if you think, however, that Wilhelm Reich is the only far leftist to have ever said something like this, well, you would be very, very mistaken. Take, for example, what Mario Mielli had to say in his book Towards a Gay Communism. Specifically, Mielli states, quote, In dealing with the assertion of heterosexuality, we have seen how its supremacy, determined by the way of the Oedipal phase, is based on the repression of homoerotic tendencies. The revolutionary homosexual struggle is thus waged against a form of oppression that is prior to Oedipus. Oedipus is negated by negating its premises. Deleuze, again with benevolent impulse, admits, There is, of course, a revolutionary potential in certain homosexual groups. I believe this is not just because they are homosexual. It is rather that their homosexuality has allowed them to question the differences between the sexes. And through this questioning, they become able, in their marginal position, to tackle the problem of sexual desire as well. Thank you very much. We revolutionary queens see in the child not so much Oedipus, or the future Oedipus, as the potentially free human being. We do indeed love children. We are able to desire them erotically, in response to their own erotic
erotic wishes, and we can openly and with open arms grasp the rush of sensuality that they pour out and make love with them. That is why pedophilia is so strictly condemned. It sends messages of love to the child whom society through the family seeks to traumatize, educastrate, and negate, imposing on the child's eroticism the Oedipal grid. The oppressive heterosexual society forces the child into the latency period, but this is nothing but the deadly introduction to the prison of a latent life. Pedophilia, on the other hand, is an arrow of libido directed at the fetus. In other words, Mario Miele not only thinks that sexual repression is a bad thing and that pedophilia is a good thing, but that pedophilia will also turn children into being communist revolutionaries. And so if you're a far leftist and your goal is to turn people into communist revolutionaries, and you believe what Mario Miele has to say as far as a method to accomplish that, then it's not exactly difficult to see why exactly you would start supporting that sort of disgusting behavior. And on that subject, those two previous passages were an absolute slog to get through because of just how disgusted I became reading the damn things. But unfortunately, I'm also only getting started here. And I really do need to make the point of just how pervasive this mindset is within far leftist ideology. So let's move on to another far leftist, specifically Gail Rubin. Most notably, let's talk about where she says, quote, It is harder for most people to sympathize with actual boy lovers. Like communists and homosexuals in the 1950s, boy lovers are so stigmatized that it is difficult to find defenders for their civil liberties, let alone their exotic orientation. Consequently, the police have feasted on them. Local police, the FBI, and watchdog postal inspectors have joined to build a huge apparatus whose sole aim is to wipe out the community of men who love underaged youth. In 20 years or so, when some of the smoke has cleared, it will be much easier to show that these men have been the victims of a savage and undeserved witch hunt. A lot of people will be embarrassed by their collaboration with this persecution, but it will be too late to do much good for those men who have spent their lives in prison. So yeah, that's Gail Rubin just casually comparing homosexuality to pedophilia to try to argue that pedophilia isn't actually bad and instead is just an innocent sexual orientation. And not only that, but that pedophiles are also victims you know, rather than victimizers like everyone else thinks. It's also worth noting, by the way, that Gail Rubin isn't just some random nobody. She is a key far leftist academic figure, and the work that this quote comes from, Thinking Sex, is often considered to be her magnum opus. So yes, the very words and rhetoric of the far left are the best asset and tool imaginable to use against them. With that in mind, it becomes clear that Grums is inadvertently advocating for depriving himself and everyone else of the absolute best asset to destroy far leftism. Where Grums calls for censoring wokeism, I call for a policy of anti-censorship towards wokeism. I call for spreading the word as widely as possible that the woke crowd are all literal rape lovers. And my proof to demonstrate this will be their own words. And the fact that I can prove all of this will cause far more damage to the far left than censoring them ever could hope to achieve. We, dear viewer, have a golden opportunity here. The far left have given us the very resources necessary to render that ideology itself permanently crippled beyond any hope of repair. We can utterly break wokeness to such a degree that it will never be able to recover. And the answer is not to censor them. It is instead to spread their own rhetoric as far and wide as possible, to make the general public hate them in a manner that far leftists deserve to be hated. All of this is to say once again that Grums is wrong about censorship. And like I said, I get why there are people that are amicable to the idea. To them and to Grums, I would offer what I suggest as a far, far more effective alternative. On that subject, for those curious, I will be providing a link to the full video that I made which that clip came from, in addition to the tweets from Grums that I have cited. I of course welcome anyone who is a supporter of Grums onto the channel, and look forward to what you have to say. But in any case, this has been Ace. Hope to see you guys again soon. Take care. Ace out.